Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Princeton, New Jersey. My name is Sean Sublet, and I want to welcome you to our continuing webinar series here at Climate Central. Uh, this is part of our Climate Matters and Climate Matters in the Newsroom program, where we get scientists and journalists connected together on climate change topics. Today, we're going to provide a deeper analysis of 2018 or December 2018 polling data on climate change opinions and attitudes in the U.S. so that journalists and meteorologists can better understand the audiences that they are serving. Again, my name is Sean Sublet. Many of you already know me. I'm a meteorologist working here on the Climate Matters program at Climate Central. Those of you, those of you joining us for the first time, Climate Central is a nonprofit and non-advocacy organization working to communicate the science and impacts of our changing climate to the public. And my regular co-host, Bernadette woods Plecky is out of the office in D.C. today, so I'll be walking us through some of the logistics. And here's what they, what they are. We, we do ask that you keep your microphone or telephone on mute uh, during the, uh, the entire uh, conversation here, if you will. If you have questions during the presentation, which we do encourage, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen, direct your question to everyone and I will be monitoring those and we can jump in uh, as needed or we can just take questions at the end, which, whichever we need. Uh, we've got a, an hour allotted, but please feel free to jump off if you need to. Uh, we hope to get most of the core uh, of the information here in the next 20 to 30 minutes or so. And if you do have to jump away, that's all right. We record all of our webinars and we keep them online at our website, medialibrary.climatecentral.org slash workshops and webinars. We'll repeat that address at the end of the presentation. But if you go into a Google search for workshops and webinars, Climate Central, uh, it will show up pretty easily there as well. So our guest today is our good friend, Dr. Edward Maybach, or we just call him Ed around the office here. <laughs> Ed is a, works at the George Mason Center, he's the director, excuse me, the George Mason Center for Climate Change Communication and has worked on the academic side of our Climate Matters program since its inception, and has recently been named a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and has also got a background in public health, which helps tremendously with discussing the real-world impacts of our changing climate. Ed earned his PhD in Communication Science at Stanford, his Master's in Public Health at San Diego State, and his Bachelor's in Psychology at UC San Diego. That's a brief introduction. Ed has done so much good work. You can follow him on Twitter there, uh, Maybach Ed. With that, uh, let's go ahead and, and turn this over to uh, Dr. Maybach. Ed, you still there, buddy? I am here. Thank you, Sean. All right. So you go ahead and take control and, and let her rip. All right. Do you see my screen? I do. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here this morning. So I um, have the pleasure to, to walk you through um, not only sort of a, the latest polling results from our partnership um, with my, my dear friend and colleague at, at uh, Yale, um, Tony Leiseritz, um, but we've been doing, we've had this polling partnership going for the past 11 years now. So we do these polls every six months. We've been doing them for 11 years. It gives us the advantage of, of not only looking at the current snapshot of, of what's sort of on the public's mind with regard to climate change, but to get a sense of the direction that they are trending, which is enormously um, illuminative in the sense of uh, understanding, are, are we moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? So I'm gonna give you a quick shot at that uh, this morning. Hopefully can go through that in about 15 or uh, well, probably more like 20, 25 minutes. And then I look forward to engaging with you and hearing what's on your mind. Okay. Bingo. Um, so uh, essentially I'm gonna make four points. Uh, the first point is that over the past couple of years, we really have seen big shifts um, in both public understanding and, and engagement in the issue of climate change. Um, the second point I'm going to make and, and back up with data is that there really is surprisingly strong support for a range of different climate policies, climate solutions, um, and the public's interest in seeing climate solutions isn't only limited to 
what our elected officials can do. And I think that's an important point to make. Um, the third point coming closer to your business is that news audiences, the public, in other words, news audiences say they, they really aren't hearing a lot about climate change in the news. And, and yet we think, based on the questions we ask them, we, we think there's a strong interest um, in learning more, that we know for a fact that the public has a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and then the fourth and the final point that I'm going to make is probably the most important point, which is I'm simply going to walk you through the Yale Climate Opinion Maps because they're just a remarkable opportunity for you to open up a window into the uh, sort of the hearts and minds of your audience because those, those maps are downscaled. You know, whether, whether you are a journalist writing for a national outlet or, or whether you are writing for your hometown uh, newspaper, you can get a sense of what your audiences are thinking and feeling with regard to climate change. Um, by way of background, I do want to make one important point, and that is our research has identified um, that there really are five key beliefs about climate change that are strongly predictive of um, what I consider to be appropriate attitudes and appropriate actions with regard to climate change. And when I say appropriate, I mean uh, attitudes and, and actions that belie the fact that we have a problem, that, that our climate is changing, um, that it's a, a problem worthy of attack, in other words, worthy of solutions, um, and the actions are simply getting involved in a variety of ways to either encourage your elected officials or appointed officials to take action um, and or to engage with corporate uh, and, and business decision makers to encourage them to take action. So those five key beliefs that, that um, are strongly predictive of what, I've, what I consider appropriate attitudes and actions are pretty darn simple. Understanding that climate change is real, understanding that it's human caused, understanding that there is a consensus among the experts that virtually all climate scientists agree that human caused climate change is occurring, um, understanding that it is bad for people, not just for plants, penguins, and polar bears. In other words, understanding that, that humans have skin in the game. And then finally, having a sense of hope, a sense of there are actions we can take that will make a difference. The horse hasn't irretrievably left the barn, I believe the expression is. So those are the five key beliefs that our research shows are particularly important in differentiating those Americans who understand the scope of our problem and are getting involved in supporting solutions versus those people who are somewhere else, either uh, in, in opposition to the, the, the idea of climate change or, or simply not really thinking about it one way or the other. So let me walk you through what our current, most current data shows about each of those five key beliefs. Um, for each of these- Hey Ed, it's Sean, real quick. Yes. We did get one, one question I think is kind of relevant. Did you review your polling population sample group to give us a sense of, of who you're actually polling? Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have said that right off the top. Um, great question. All of our polls, um, all the way back to November in 2008, they're all done in exactly the same way. Um, we work with a company at the time, was called GFK. Um, we chose to work with them because they do random digit dialing um, to create a sample of 50,000 households in America um, who will agree to take, uh, to essentially answer uh, surveys. And uh, so every member of the household who is um, either a, a teen with, with parental permission or an adult indicates whether or not they are willing to take surveys. And all of those are, all of those 50,000 households are collected using random digit dialing. So essentially the base panel is a representative sample of a large number of households. And then we conduct a random sample via the web. We essentially work with the company to send their their panelists an email to invite them to take our surveys. Um, it has, this is, it, it's a little bit hard to say there is a gold standard for survey research anymore because all forms of surveying are, other than literally going and knocking on doors, all forms of surveys are, are, are challenged in the current era, but this is um, a well-established um, random, essentially population-based random selection of the, the public. 
And, and the important, I think the most important point though, is we do it the same way with the same company, each and every one of our polls. So when I show you tracking data, which I'm, I'm now about to do, you can understand that, that the, the differences you see from time point to time point are um, you know, essentially driven by the fact that the public is changing as opposed to our methods are changing. So coming back to the point I was making before, um, that, that what, you know, essentially the question is what proportion of the public understands that global warming is real? Um, the question we ask on all of these slides is down in the lower left-hand corner. So in this case, the very first question we ask is, we, we give a very brief definition of what global warming is, and we say, um, do you think global warming is happening? We allow people to say yes, no, or don't know. And what you see here over the, the sort of the broad sweep of this data is 11 years ago, um, seven out of 10 Americans said that yes, global warming is happening. Um, most recently in December of 2018, 73% of the public said yes, global warming is happening. So uh, on one hand, you might say we are more or less back to where we were a decade ago, and that would be a reasonable conclusion, but data I'm about to show you would suggest um, there's actually something important going on in this upward trend over the past 10 years, particularly over the past five years, to suggest that the public is more sure of their convictions now than they were in the past. So the, the fact that seven out of 10 Americans now say global warming is happening, we're not likely to see a decline in that anytime soon, if ever again. Hey Ed, another little thing real quick, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, do, you, do you, have you done any, any kind of testing using climate change versus global warming uh, as a question? Yeah, we've, we've actually, it's a really good question. We, good enough that we've spent a lot of time on our research team um, testing whether or not it makes a difference when we ask these questions using the, the term global warming or using the term climate change. Um, in short, it makes very little difference. The public does, um, different segments of the public do have different associations with the two terms, global warming and climate change, but they tend to be rather subtle and nuanced. Um, so we use that we always have and will continue to use the term global warming because the majority of our survey respondents tell us that is the term they themselves use. They're, they also they're, tell us they're perfectly comfortable with both terms, but when they talk about it, they themselves use global warming. And also real quick, a couple other people have chimed in. Um, can you speak to uh, these trends and their statistical significance? and talk anything about the margin of, of error. Sure, so the margin of error around any of these data points is, is gonna be about plus or minus 3%. Um, so you, we, we don't make claims of, of uh, an upward trend when, or a downward trend when they, it is less than 3%. Um, but as you can see from example on, on this next slide that I wanna focus your attention on, um, it's really, what I'm, what I'm asking you to look at is sort of the five-year trend. So if you go to the middle of the chart, um, 3.15, that would be March of 2015, and, uh, and uh, then look to the, to the left, excuse me, to the right, you can see that the increase in the proportion of Americans who tell us they are very or extremely sure that global warming is happening has, in, has gone up by 14 percentage points in the past five years. Um, and there's been a small decrease in the proportion of people who do not believe it is happening, who say they are extremely sure or very sure. So the important point here is that um, not only do we see a small increase in the proportion of people who say that yes, global warming is happening, but perhaps more importantly, people are becoming more confident in their convictions that they've reached the right conclusion. So to the second point I brought up, that global warming, that it, it's us, global warming is human caused. Um, we ask people uh, quite directly, assuming global warming is happening, do you think it's caused mostly by human activities, mostly by changes in the natural environment, um, or don't you know? And uh, what you can see is there's been about a 10 percentage point increase over the past five years in the proportion of Americans who tell us it's mostly caused by human activities and about a 10% decrease in the proportion who say it's mostly caused by changes in the natural environment. So on one hand, you could think of this as a glass half full. 
um, and that would be perfectly valid. On the other hand, I would encourage you to notice that, that the glass is filling as opposed to draining, which is a really important point because early, a decade ago, largely in response, we believe largely in response to partisan cues from partisan uh, policy uh, makers and uh, as reported in the media, um, and all of the uncertainty related to the, uh, the, the nations and the world's economy at that time, there really, the, gl the glass was draining, it was not filling. So in the interim, in the ensuing years, the glass has been filling. So the third point that I mentioned that is particularly important is understanding the extent of the scientific consensus about human-caused climate change. We actually asked a couple of we ask this question in a couple of different ways, but this is the only one that only question that we've asked every time we conduct this survey. And we simply say, which comes closest to your view? Um, most scientists think global warming is happening, or there's a lot of disagreement about global warming among scientists, or most scientists think global warming isn't happening, or I don't know. Um, what you can see, again, over the past five years, the blue line, the proportion of people who say most scientists think global warming is happening, um, there's been a, a fairly sharp uptick, more than 15 percentage points over the past five years. Uh, again, sort of reflecting on what this means based on other research we have done, we actually now call this belief about the science, the, the perception of sci the scientific consensus we now call this a gateway belief, sort of uh, pivoting off the notion of, of a gateway drug. Um, it is the most fundamental thing that a layman can understand about global warming, whether or not they think that the experts, people who make this their living, um, are all in agreement or whether or not they think there's a lot of disagreement. The reason why such a large proportion, and it's only one out of four Americans, but that is still a very large proportion, say there's a lot of disagreement uh, about global warming among scientists, is because that has been the number one talking point, the number one um, objective of the, the climate misinformation campaign over the past couple of decades, particularly over the past decade. Um, so the fact that we see over the past five years a real sharp uptick in that is certainly a a testament, at least we think it is a testament, to the fact that lots of organizations are trying to, to do their best to explain the extent of the scientific consensus because it is such an important piece of information to understand. So now coming to the fourth point, that global, that global warming is bad, that it's harmful to people, not just plants, penguins, and polar bears. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of different takes on that. The first one is a question we, we asked, when do you think global warming will start to harm people in the United States? And we, the options we give them are they're being harmed right now, um, in about 10 years, in about 25 years, about 50 years, about 100 years, or never, okay? So the line I'm showing, the graph I'm showing you here is simply the proportion who say people are in the United States are being harmed right now. So over the past five years, that's gone from 32% to 48%. Uh, again, about a 15 percentage point increase over the past five years. And this, I, I would be remiss if I did not point out, this is the number one, the, the leading message of both the third national climate assessment of which I was a member of the, uh, the authorship committee, as well as the more recent fourth national climate assessment, which was released last November, the, the main, uh, the leading message from both of those reports was essentially that climate change is happening here now in communities across America. So what you see in this data here is that um, whether it is the national climate assessment and or whatever else is driving it, more Americans understand that more of our countrymen and women are already being harmed by global warming. It's not only seen as a future threat. So um, our research has shown that the, that feeling you have personally experienced the effect of global warming is particularly important. So this is the question we ask. We, it's simply a, an agree-disagree question, and the, the statement is, I have personally experienced the effects of global warming. 
And you'll see in the blue line that um, five years ago, fewer than a third of the public said they had personally experienced the effects of global warming. And today we're getting closer to half of Americans who feel they have personally experienced the effects of global warming. When you think of the year we had last year with fires across the West and um, extreme rain events, hurricanes and extreme precipitation events across the, the South and the Southeast, it's not really surprising that an increasing proportion of Americans feel that they are personally experiencing these impacts. Um, and I, I would have to say as a shout out to many of you on this phone, I think that you, uh, are, you are all playing a really important role in that. So until quite recently, I used to say that um, the majority of Americans understand that the climate is changing, but they misperceive it as being distant in space, time, and species. So in space, they think of it happening somewhere else, not here. Typically in you know, parts of the world they couldn't locate on a map. Um, in terms of time, they think they used to think of it as happening in the year 2100 and, or 2050, not, not today. And in terms of species, as I said before, they, most Americans tend to think of it as harming polar bears and, and not people. But when you look at the data on this particular graph, and this is not overtime data, but just the most current snapshot, you see that my generalization is still true to an extent, but it's not true to, to the extent that I feel comfortable saying it anymore. Because if you look over on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that 49% of the public say that they personally, that global warming will cause them personally either a great deal of harm or a moderate amount of harm. 56% believe their family will be harmed a great deal or a moderate amount. 57% um, feel that other people in their community will be harmed to that degree. 65% feel that people in the U.S. will be harmed a great deal or a moderate amount. Um, and as you move across the slide, getting towards future generations of people, it goes all the way up to 75%. So my takeaway from this data is that currently, the average American, at least 50, almost 50% of Americans, feel that they and members of their family will be harmed substantially by global warming. To me, that indicates they're not only seeing it as a future threat anymore, they're understanding it as a clear and present threat. Hey, Ed, another question that, that's come in. Do you, having said that, or, or dovetailing off what you just said, do you see any kind of association or correlation between people accepting global warming, climate change, and them saying that it's affected them personally? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very strong association. So feeling that you have personally experienced global warming is a very strong predictor of both the attitudes that I mentioned at the, the top of the hour, as, as well as personally getting involved um, in, in policy advocacy and consumer advocacy and supporting a sort of a muscular um, American response to the problem, supporting the, the premise that we should be dealing with this problem. So this, if of all the data slides I'm gonna show you, in some respects, I feel like this is the most important one. Um, risk, uh, people who understand, uh, people who study psychologists and, and other social scientists who study risk perception, um, they really have concluded that risk in a very fundamental sense is best characterized as a feeling, as opposed to as cognitions, as thoughts, as sort of cold, hard, calculated, uh, um, understanding of, of statistics and probabilities. And so what I'm showing you here is simply the proportion of people who tell us how, uh, who, based on how worried they are about global warming. The bottom um, part, part of the bar, uh, the bar graph is that the people who tell us they are very worried. So if you look over the past five years, about five years ago, one out of 10 of us said we were very worried. Now, almost three out of 10 of us say we are very worried, and almost seven out of 10 of us say we are at least somewhat worried about global warming. This is a very visceral response that people have, um, and like feeling personally affected by global warming, this is a very powerful predictor of people's subsequent actions and, and uh, predispositions with regard to wanting to see a collective response. 
So the final one of those five key ideas, those key beliefs, was the belief that, uh, that there's hope, there are actions we can take. We've looked at that in a variety of different ways. I'm just going to show you two little snapshots of that right now. Um, this is the question we, we ask people to uh, agree or to indicate their agreement or disagreement with it. We say it's already too late to do anything about global warming. Um, I'm <laughs> I actually am a little bit conflicted about these data because I, uh, I, not exactly sure how I would answer this question. But uh, two percent said that yes, they strongly agree that that is true. The horse has left the barn. Twelve percent say, say they somewhat uh, agree, um, but the majority, uh, a really substantial majority, say no, no, it's not true that there, uh, it isn't too late to do anything about global warming. And we know from our analysis of this type of data that people who have a sense of hope um, are more likely to actually be activating their, their worry into taking action themselves. And, and that's why this, this particular slide is, is sort of, you know, we believe, quite important. Um, you can see here charted both the degree to which people tell us they're somewhat or very worried and the degree to which they tell us they are moderately or very hopeful. So over the long term, the degree of worry has done nothing but increase. Um, over the long term, the degree of hope has waxed and waned and um, is currently waning pretty sharply. So if you just look over the past two years, you see this really clear um, disaggregation or, or trend line, two trend lines moving in the opposite direction from one another. Um, we think based on our read of our data that that is not a good thing. That uh, as, when worry, it's good that worry is increasing, it is not good that being hopeful is, is on the decline. Um, so of course there is no such thing as the public. You all know that given that you produce, <laughs> that you produce news for the public, you know that they don't all start from the same place and they don't all respond to your journalism in the same way. Um, <laughs> We have shown through our segmentation uh, work that there are six distinct ways of seeing climate change. We call the six distinct groups of Americans global warming six Americas. Um, currently, uh, I'll, I won't introduce you to them all because that probably doesn't warrant going into it at that detail, but I'll simply say that when you look at them, they're arrayed upon a, a continuum from the left, the alarm segment, currently three out of 10 Americans, um, who, like myself, are quite concerned about climate change and to a greater or lesser degree, um, they, virtually all of the alarms support a muscular response, support a variety of policies, and to a greater or lesser degree, they are personally rolling up their sleeves and getting involved. On the right-hand side of the continuum is a group called the dismissive. Um, they like the alarmed, they feel very strongly about the issue, but they've reached the exact opposite conclusion, a conclusion that is very much at odds with the scientific realities of climate change. They feel it isn't, isn't happening, or if it is, it certainly isn't human cause, um, and they feel there is a whole lot of hysteria in America about it, and the solutions, the proposed solutions, would be far worse than the, the problem actually is. So the reason I wanted to introduce you to the Six Americas is to make one point. And that point is that um, over the past, certainly over the past decade, but in particular over the past five years, the segments, uh, people have been drifting leftward on these Six America, in the Six Americas continuum. So if you look down on the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see there's been a 15 percentage point increase in the past five years in the proportion of Americans who are alarmed. Um, that's essentially a doubling of the alarm segment in the past five years. And going up to the top of the slide, you can see there's been a five percentage point decline in the proportion who are dismissive and a six percentage point decline in the proportion who are doubtful. Um, so there's been a real movement to the left, um, both literally on my slide and figuratively with regard to their uh, their views about climate change, um, and uh, you know, in those that that sh leftward shift is very much in line with the realities, the scientific realities of human-caused climate change. So let me take you very quickly now through um, the second point, which is the the public support for action. Um, the first question that we ask people, essentially, we, we try to come at it from the big picture first and drill down and go go deeper. So the first question we ask is, well, should the U.S. reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, um, regardless of what other countries do? 
only if other industrialized countries reduce theirs, only if other industrialized and developing countries reduce theirs, or we shouldn't do it, or, or I don't know. Um, and as you can see from this slide, that's seven out of 10 voters. Now I'm switching from all respondents to only voters, people who tell us that they um, are um, voted in the last election. So seven out of 10 voters say that we should be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions regardless of what other countries do. As you move across to the right-hand side, you can see there's a, a pretty sharp distinction between Democrats and Republicans on this issue and, and even between moderate uh, liberal and moderate Republicans versus conservative Republicans. But it, it's still worth noting that 48% of Republicans say, yes, we should be doing this regardless of what other countries do. Um, the next question is, do you think that global warming should be a low, medium, high, or very high priority for our president and Congress? So we get about six out of 10 Americans who say it should be a um, high or very high priority for the president and Congress. You can see that there's a quite a sharp uh, gradient across the political continuum here. Um, get a real strong drop off that it's only one out of four Republicans who feel this should be a high priority for the president and, and Congress, whereas you get more than eight out of 10 Democrats saying that. To the point that I raised earlier, um, who do Americans want to see doing more to address global warming? And it isn't the president and Congress. It's actually corporations and industry. So 75% of our survey respondents tell us, um, this is voters again, um, tell us that they think corporations and industry should be doing more, whereas only two thirds, about 67%, say the president and Congress should be doing more. Um, and then I point you to the very bottom piece of data on that slide, 53% feel that the media should be doing more, which uh, I guess it means uh, that uh, you guys are doing, um, you, you, are, you are meeting the needs of many of your uh, audiences because they feel you're doing enough. But as a point I'm gonna make in a moment is they, they've got an appetite for more. Um, coming back to their support for policies, there are some policies that we see incredible support all the way across the political continuum. The first two on this slide are, are the best examples. Um, so this, we ask people, do you support or oppose the following policies? The first one being funding more research into renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind. And you get almost nine out of 10 members of the public saying, yes, I support that, including eight out of 10 conservative Republicans, which is really, really important. Um, almost as high level of support for providing tax rebates for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles or solar panels, essentially using public resources to help us adopt these things that are ready for adoption. And you get 85% of all voters saying, saying yes, I'm for that, including 67% of conservative Republicans. Um, the notion of a, car, a revenue neutral carbon tax, I, I won't say it's very much in play on Capitol Hill today, but I will certainly say there are large numbers of, of uh, um, elected officials on the Hill who would like to see a revenue neutral carbon tax enacted, and seven out of 10 of their voters agree with that. They think this is a, um, they strongly or somewhat support a revenue neutral carbon tax, um, including half of Republican voters. So it isn't, it absolutely is not the notion that a revenue neutral carbon tax is a non-starter with the American people or even with Republicans. Um, this question actually is sort of, uh, is our plain language version of the clean power plan. Um, we ask people how much do you support or oppose setting strict carbon dioxide emission limits on existing coal fire power plants to reduce global warming and improve public health. Power plants would have to reduce their emissions and or invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency. The cost of electricity to consumers and companies would likely increase. So even though the Trump administration has said they will disband this, this is still the law of the land. Um, not that the public necessarily knows that, but seven out of 10 members of the, the voting public say they support that, including five out of 10 Republicans. Now here's the kicker, a question we asked for the first time in December about the Green New Deal. We asked people first if they had ever heard of the Green New Deal and only 15% had, and then we described the Green New Deal for them in the way is at the bottom of the slide. I won't read that whole thing. We just tried to simplify it as best we could. Um, 
And the real surprise is that the way we described it, eight out of 10 voters, including almost six out of 10 conservative Republicans say they support that proposition. There is something here in the Green New Deal that at least before um, you know, the attack dogs started uh, uh, going after this, this proposal, um, resonated pretty deeply with Americans across the political continuum. So this is a, a proposal that we're gonna keep our eyes on very closely going forward. Um, now coming to you and in your business, um, uh, point you to actually the, the top bar in this uh, graph. Um, we ask people about how often do you hear about global warming in the media? And uh, the answer options we give them are at least once a week, at least once a month, several times a year, once a year or less often, never, or uh, you know, essentially, I, I'm not sure. And what you see is that about a third of all Americans, so all adults, say they hear about global warming in the media at least once a week. Um, but that means two thirds are hearing about it less than once a week, um, which is really interesting uh, for me because I, I live so deep in the bubble, I hear about global warming in the media multiple times every day. I'm sure all of you do as well. But this is what the public tells us. Two thirds say they are hearing about it certainly less than once a, a week, um, really probably more like once a month or less frequently. So even though a lot of news is being reported, a lot of news is not necessarily being received, um, which is particularly interesting, interesting in comparison to this data point. This is the degree, this is what people tell us how important the issue of global warming is to them personally. So if you look at the blue line, you'll see that this, this upward trend of about 15 percentage points mirrors pretty closely that worry trend line I showed you earlier. So seven out of 10 people tell us that global warming is currently extremely very or somewhat important to them. And yet they're only a third to tell us that they are hearing about it in the news once a week or more frequently. We ask people how strongly they feel each of a variety of different emotions when they think about the issue of global warming. And I'll just focus your attention, please, on the, that set of bars over on the left-hand side. Um, this is the proportion who say they, they are interested in, uh, they, they feel the emotion of interest. Um, when they think about global warming, we think of this as a, uh, a proxy for how interested they are. You can see we've broken it down into the proportion who believe that global warming is happening. That's the blue bar. So eight out of 10 of them say they're interested. Um, four out of 10 people who say they don't know if it's happening tell us they're interested. And even two out of 10 um, Americans who say it is not happening, they say they are interested. So there, there's clearly a level of interest in this issue, an interest in, in learning more. Now I can bring this to, to you and your readers in particular. I hope you all know about the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. My colleague, Tony Leiserwitz and, and his colleagues at, at Yale and uh, UC Santa Barbara and Utah State have taken our public opinion poll data and they've developed an approach to downscaling it all the way down to the county level, to the metro area level, to the congressional district level um, and, and to the state level. So on about 20 some different indicators of public understanding, including support for public policies, um, you can look as closely as your, uh, at your audience as you would like. So um, I work at George Mason in Virginia, so I'm simply showing you that uh, in Virginia, the proportion of people who say that global warming is happening is somewhere between uh, 70 and 75%. I believe it's actually about 74% currently. I didn't, included on the slide, but in, in the town where I work, Fairfax, the county, excuse me, in Fairfax County, 77% say that global warming is happening, which is seven percentage points higher than the national average. Um, if you're more interested in, you work in a, a, a metro area, your, your uh, viewing audience or reading audience is sort of metro-based, media market-based, you can also use the maps to, to uh, um, study your audience on that basis. So here is the indicator I showed you before, the proportion of people who hear about global warming in the media at least once a week. Um, in, the, uh, in the Washington DC metro area, it is 24% as compared 
posed to compared to 22% in 2018 for the US at large. Um, so even here in the Washington media market, people aren't hearing about this issue in the media nearly as much as you might expect. Um, these are simply the, the different beliefs and risk perceptions that are in the maps. Um, so there's, uh, you know, as you've already seen in my slides, worry about global warming, the belief that it's uh, harming people in the US, the belief that it will harm people personally, um, and then a whole variety of indicators of policy support. For example, going, um, going all the way down to the bottom of the slide, a, a, a measure that I'm particularly interested in, it's the fact that 74% of people in the Washington DC metro area say that environmental protection is more important than economic growth. Um, turns out that that's really a false dichotomy. Most Americans believe that investing in the environment is, is tantamount to investing in our economy. So that's it. Those are the four points I wanted to make. And, and now I will pause and, and hear the points that you would like to make. Uh, I'm going to get into a couple of questions uh, from the group. But first of all, thank you, Ed. I very much appreciate you uh, putting that all together for us. Uh, quickly on the Yale maps, how often are those updated with, with new information, new polling data? I mean, I understand that you're kind of using a model to downscale that data. But how often is it updated? Um, the first time they, they created the maps was in 2016. The first time they updated it was in 2018. So you can actually see the 2016 maps still the online and the 2018 maps. I, I, I hope they will update it before 2020. Um, do it sometime this year, but, but I, I can't promise that to be so. Uh, Jen, okay. Jen, Jennifer Marlon at, uh, at the, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication is um, she's the person to ask when they will next be updated. Sure, sure. Uh, another question we had, this is several parts. I'll just kind of go through all of this. Um, do we know what people want to hear from the media? Uh, have we moved past information and now they are needing or wanting a list of things to do? What do they need slash want to hear? Yes, yeah, so it, it's a great question, and I'm simply going to go back to my Six America slide because because the different uh, groups want to hear different things. So the um, the the twenty let's just call them twenty five percent at the right hand side of the the uh, Six Americas continuum, the disengaged, the doubtful, the dismissive, they really want to hear more about why. How do you know? that this is happening. How do you know that this is human caused? Um, the groups in, in uh, the cautious and the concerned, their primary question tends to be essentially, how will this affect me? They're particularly interested in local impacts. What they know about global warming tends to be characterized by what they've read about sort of global impacts and impacts in the future. They don't really know a lot about impacts on their lives. Um, and the alarmed, and to some degree the concerned, they really want to know, what can I do and what can we do, we collectively do, to, to stop this thing? So the, the Six Americas have different questions that they're interested in having answers to. But, but I, I will say, really, across the continuum, um, because of that reason I, I brought up earlier, that most people saw it as a very most people, most Americans have long accepted that it's happening, but they saw it as very distant from them. So information that makes it proximal to them, that shows them the skin they have in the game, the skin their family members and community members have in the game, that's the kind of information that, that most Americans are particularly interested in. Okay, well, well on that note, uh, does the research also show what type of stories and techniques are most effective at reaching the audience. In other words, you have suggestions on reporting approaches that might resonate the most, including with people who might be unconcerned or dismissive. Obviously, local, local, local is always is paramount. What else can you kind of add to that? Uh, local, local, local. I, <laughs> well, first of all, I feel ridiculous answering that question because I'm on the line with a, a whole group of professionals who know more about how to engage their audience than I ever will. But nevertheless, the, Sean, you gave me the question, so I, I'll go ahead and give a quick answer, and we'll hear what your uh, what our colleagues have to say. But well, I guess no, having your your input on the social sciences, I think, is 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 where we're kind of driving in here. 
Yeah, so lo local, of course, uh, narrative-based, featuring real people in communities and how what this means to them. You know, why, why is it that narratives work better than statistics? Because the human brain is, is fundamentally wired to understand stories and to understand so information based on social proof, not information based on, on um, numbers, on analysis. Uh, for those of you who've read Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that's fundamentally what his whole book is about. That we are, we all do have two different com complementary information processing systems. One that deals well with stories and um, experiential learning, and one that deals well with analysis and, and numerical, um, you know, dealing with numbers. But when it comes, even highly trained specialists like all of you and me, um, stories always trump the numbers because our our personal we draw um we draw information risk information in our world based more on our personal experience than on analytical analysis so again local and story based feature people what it means to them let them tell it in their own words let um and not just for impacts but but solutions as well feature people and what they are doing what local organizations are doing um, to to harness the wind potential in their community to harness the solar potential in their community that's the kind of story that gets people excited there's some really great research showing what kinds of stories get shared off of news websites um, done by uh, Catherine Milkman and, and her colleagues at uh, at the Wharton School and you know it's usually store positive stories are shared more frequently than negative stories Wow stories, stories that inspire awe, are shared more uh, often than stories that don't. Um, and, and stories that, um, I'm totally blanking on the third major feature, but <laughs> that, that, that's the, uh, that, that would be my answer. But again, I, I would really defer to all of you as the real experts. Sure, sure. Um, when we, while we've seen this kind of big shift over the last five years, and particularly the last 18 months to 24 months, what would you say are the major factors that have influenced this shift in the attitudes in this time? I don't really have a definitive answer to that. Um, the research over a longer period of time, like the past couple of decades, has shown that the, the most important predictor of public, you know, sort of public response to these kinds of questions tends to be the, the cues, the, the cues of political elites, meaning what the officials in your political party are saying, um, I think actually we're starting to see a disaggregation of that. Um, my personal belief is that there are a lot of Americans who are horrified that uh, the chief climate denier is, is in the White House. Um, actually, many of the chief climate deniers are in the White House currently. Um, so I, I think that under the final years of the Obama administration, there may have been a certain sense of um, false assurance that this guy's got it. We don't have to be worried. He's on it. He's talking about it. And, uh, and I think that right now the opposite is happening. Many more Americans are both seeing, experiencing it through their own lives or the lives of their loved ones. I personally was raised in California and my home state was, as all of you know, you know, huge proportion, huge portions of it were a fire last summer and fall. Um, so more of us have personally experienced it, and, and, and I do believe that more of us are worried that the White House is not taking this seriously. Well, back to your point about, about California and wildfires, obviously that's, that's huge. Um, but we've had back-to-back -back very destructive, at least to the United States, uh, tropical seasons with phenomenal amounts of rain, uh, and then a, also a very intense structurally damaging storm uh, in Hurricane Michael. And I don't know if there's much data on this at all yet, Ed, but do you have a sense of how much that might have played a role in the shift in opinions, those two things, the tropical season in particular? Um, we ask people about that. So in our most recent survey, we actually do ask people to what degree did they feel that various mega storms that happened in America last year were uh, caused by, or can, uh, what, what role climate change played in them? The problem is um, it, the responses look almost identical to the worry responses. So people who tell us they're worried about global warming um, 
also tell us they think that global warming played a role in, in various mega storms. Um, and you know, one, one of the human tendencies is when people don't actually know the answer to a question that you ask them, they will often revise the question to the closest question they can create that seems similar to the question you ask them. So one of the, you know, one of the downsides to survey research that we try to guard against as best we can is <clears throat> don't ask people questions that they don't really have an answer to or an opinion about because what they will do is they will substitute the question for another question and, and thus leave you scratching your head. So my guess is most Americans really don't, couldn't tell you in a co any even vaguely coherent way in what way climate change you know, create, uh, contributed to uh, Hurricane Maria or, or Harvey before it, um, or Michael in, in North Carolina this past year. Um, but, but one thing I can tell you about Michael in particular, and I think it is Mike, was Michael in North Carolina, correct? No, it was Florence. Michael came into the, the uh, Florida Pan Am. I'm sorry for that mix up. So Florence, right. So uh, within a week, of um, Florence really, you know, seriously smacking North Carolina hard, we started to hear, within a couple of days actually, we started to hear um, pun various pundits in the media saying it would be insensitive, or it is insensitive, to talk about any possible link between global warming and, and this storm. It's insensitive to do it while people are suffering. And we thought, well, this is a real opportunity for us to ask North Carolinians if they, dis if they agree or disagree with that premise. Do they want to hear right now about the possible link between global warming and this storm? Or do they, like those media pundits, think it's totally inappropriate? And what we found was that the vast majority of survey respondents in North Carolina said, no, we, we actually think it is totally appropriate to be addressing this in real time. This is relevant information and we would like to hear it. Sounds very good. That, that's good information to know. That's not something uh, that I was aware of either. So thank you for sharing that bit. Uh, a little more going back into some of the, to the nuts and bolts of the survey. A couple of questions here I'm going to try to, to move into one. Uh, is, is there a, a, a deeper analysis on how voters will prioritize climate policy and decision making? And are there any trends that you more specifically see in the Republican base regarding climate policy? positive signs among any segments of it? Well, the, I would say on the first part of the question, it's a real jump ball um, in the sense that there's a lot of interesting problem. There, there's sort of three general ways that, that government could respond to, to climate change in, with, uh, with you know, potentially appropriate mitigative action, preventive action. We can regulate it. So we can regulate heat trapping pollution, uh, which is sort of the way the clean power plan is, is set up. Um, we can tax it, essentially make it more expensive to, uh, to put that pollution into the atmosphere. Um, or we can invest in the kinds of uh, technologies that will actually you know, make a difference over the long run. We, um, we're really interested in this. We think the reason why the, the, the high level of support for the Green New Deal, uh, the, the level of support for the Green New Deal was so high is because it really does talk about investing in solutions more than taxing or regulating. It doesn't talk about taxing or regulating directly. Um, but one thing we've learned in our prior surveys, there's a, a fairly robust level of support, including among many Republicans for for taxing carbon pollution, particularly if it is uh, done in a revenue neutral manner, tax what we want less of, tax more what we want less of, and, and lighten the tax burden on what we want more of, namely jobs or income or what have you. Um, but there's also a very surprisingly high level of support for a regulatory approach. Um, we asked people in the past, straight up, we explained that there's two mechanisms. This was before we recognized investment as a third mechanism that government can use. And we said there are two mechanisms that government can use to address global warming. They can regulate it, they can tax it, um, they can do neither, or they can do both. Which do you prefer? And the thing that really surprised us is the majority response was both, tax and, and regulate. Um, but most Americans have heard very little about specific policies. So when you give them broad policy propositions, like investing in clean energy R&D, you get 80, 90% who say, yes, let's do that. 
Um, when you give them specific bills, like the Green New, well, Green New Deal's a proposition, it's not a bill, but the public just doesn't really know about the specifics well enough to feel, you know, for them to have a, a set view as to whether or not they think that's a good or a bad thing, which is why I say it's a bit of a jump ball. Sure, sure. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour. I have one other real quick question uh, regarding what you said about the, the folks in North Carolina. Um, can we get a piece of data or some kind of link to that information uh, that says the victims of the storms uh, do indeed want to hear about the link to climate change in nearly, at least almost real time rather than later on? Is there, is there something published on that? Do you have anything you could share? Yep, I, I can send you a link to that after the, the webinar, Sean, and you can post it. Absolutely, Todd. So we got your question, and I will get that uh, off to you. Uh, we are starting to run low on time. I apologize we couldn't get to, to everybody's question. Uh, so I'm going to take control back really quickly here and uh, get to my slides and hopefully get that up and going. There we are. That's me. And uh, just want to put a few more things out there uh, for everybody to see uh, before we close. First of all, Ed, thanks tons. Uh, for doing this with us today uh, and taking the time to, to go forward. There we go. And that's the other stuff I wanted to get up there uh, before we get to the top of the hour. The full webinar and Ed's slides are going to be available at our website, medialibrary.climatecentral.org, at our workshops and webinars page. Again, his slides and a video of the, of the uh, webinar will be made available there. If you want more information on, on the program that Ed is a director of, uh, the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication, it's climatechangecommunication.org. And I think there are links to the Yale maps through there. Or you can Google Yale Climate Change Opinion Maps, and that will go there uh, directly as well. If you have any questions later, you can email me directly at fsublet at climatecentral.org or Bernadette at bplackey at climatecentral.org as well. I'm sure Bernadette's going to be looking uh, a little bit later on uh, at what we've been doing here today. And I was just on the phone with some colleagues uh, at the National Centers for Environmental Information, uh, all about data. A lot of people want to know, where is climate data at? How robust is it? How strong is it? How, how far back does it go? How good is it? We've heard things about data cleaning. What does that mean? All that stuff. Dee Arndt, who is at the National Centers of Environmental Information in Asheville, I uh, was on the phone with him a couple of days ago. He's agreed to be our guest at our next webinar. That will be Tuesday, April 2nd. So mark your calendars now. Tuesday, April 2nd, Deke will be talking all about the data. Anything you've ever wanted to know about data, he has got the answer for it. Again, Ed, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody, we, uh, thanks for joining us. And I uh, hope to see you on the 2nd of April. Email me if you have any questions, and I'll do my best to get back to you here today or tomorrow. Hopefully, we'll have this stuff online by the close of business tomorrow. Take care, everybody, and have a good Tuesday.